But I want to talk to you guys today about, I'm sure as you guys noticed in the program, we're talking about lead generation today. Specifically, we're talking about a methodology that I'd like to share with you called the gold miner method. And really, I want to talk to you about how it's, it's uh, how the business of gold mining can teach you about systematic lead generation for your organization. Okay, so this is me. I'm Frank Cowell. I'm not a gold miner. So I want to get that on the, off the, uh, on the table first. Is I'm talking about gold mining, but I'm not a gold miner. It was interesting when I came into the airport last night, uh, one of the things that hit me right as I was exiting the terminal was uh, how Reno has this history of gold mining and they had a display there. So I tweeted at you guys last night, hopefully you saw that, really excited that gold mining is already on the minds of uh, people in Reno. I'd love to connect with you guys, so if you get a chance, you know, hit me up on Twitter, you can go to this URL here that goes to uh, the section of my agency's website where uh, all of my articles are hosted. And if you just want to shoot me an email, please do. So I'd love to connect with you guys. Uh, first thing before we get started, I am full of shit. Don't believe anything I say. I want to get that, I want to get that out of the way first. And the reason I say that is because one of the things I want to drive home is that real marketers, real leaders take action. Okay, so you guys are going to hear from a, a several different people today. You guys probably follow a lot of people on the blogosphere and on the Twitters and on the Instagrams and whatever else. <clears throat> and there's lots of gurus out there. What I want you to do is not believe any of them. Don't believe me. I want you guys to take action. I want you guys to put this in play for yourselves. And I want you to see what works for you. And I want you to measure your results. And I want you to use that data to make your decisions. So if we can start off there, that I'm the guy up here on stage, but you guys really are the stars. You guys need to go put this stuff in play and test it for yourself. So don't believe anything I say, please. I'm just here to share with you what's worked for me. <clears throat> so here's what I want to accomplish today with you guys. By the way, this is me and this is you, in case you didn't notice in that graphic there. Uh, so I want to talk to you guys about the gold miner method. It's seven stages that will greatly improve your lead generation. Uh, I want to give you guys specific action items that you can start acting on tomorrow. And at the end, I want to make an offer to help you figure out if this could work for your organization. Now, if I can accomplish all that in 60 minutes, would you guys be excited about that? Yeah, yeah all right, good, good. So that's what I try to accomplish in 60 minutes. What that means is I'm going to talk fast, I'm going to talk furious, and you guys need to take notes. I'm going to try to accomplish this in a way that at the end, there's time for you guys to ask me questions. All right, so I have a big mission ahead of me here. Uh, so before I get started, I want to talk to you about how this concept of gold mining really spoke to me. And so there's this reality TV show that you guys may have heard of. Uh, it's called Gold Rush. Anyone heard of it? OK, I, uh, I work a lot, um, at, at probably 50, 60 hours a week, and I have wife, have kids. Uh, I've got a lot going on in my life. Uh, but one of my secret vices is I just love to watch reality television. Not all reality shows, um, but this one in particular. And so Friday nights, uh, I know I have it on DVR, but I, I have to catch it on Friday night. And so I'm really obsessed with this show. So it hit me as I started looking at this show and I started really understanding the, the process of gold mining, which if you've watched the show, you actually learn what it's like to actually go through a gold mining operation. And so as I started uh, thinking about this recently, I said, you know what, what's really interesting is that the business of gold mining and the process of gold mining in the way they do it, by the way, if you watch the show, you'll, you'll know that there are several different ways to go about gold mining. The gold mining that they do is really what I'm tracking with here today. So if you're a gold miner in the audience or your great granddaddy was a gold miner, don't, please don't hit me up and tell me, well, Frank, you could also do it in a mine and then take, I, I get it, okay? So we're talking about their kind of gold mining and the process is really cool that it, how it matches up. And so I wanna share with you the seven stages of gold mining that they go through there on the show. Again, high level. First things first, what they have to do in gold mining is they have to stake their claim, right? You have to start with a piece of land, you have to start with dirt, right? The second thing they do is they architect the operation. And we're gonna go into these stages in detail as I go through. Third thing, they build the machine. They build their operation out. Now that they have that in place, they dig for and process pay dirt. You guys know what pay dirt is, right? It's the stuff that contains the gold. Then after they do all that, they separate the gold. And finally, they maintenance the operation. And when they've done all that, then they talk about how they make more money by growing the operation. Now, what's really cool is you get into this four, five, and six over and over again. So once you have your process set up, 
You get into four, five, six over and over again. It's like a cycle until you're ready to grow the operation. And so what's cool is that these seven stages are the exact same stages of a systematic lead generation program. That's what I want to share with you guys today. So let's dive into the first concept of staking your claim. Well, in gold mining, this is what you might hear them say. You might hear them say, we need to secure access to good ground. Anyone watch the show and know what I'm talking about? Good ground, right? Well, what does that mean in terms of business? The first thing we have to make sure of when we stake our claim is we need to make sure we have something that someone is willing to buy. We have to make sure we've got something of value that someone's willing to pull out their wallet and give you money. That's the first thing we have to do. So let's talk about how you would go about doing that. I'm a big believer in this concept, which really has nothing to do with lead generation. It has everything to do with how you think about your business. And the question is, how do you know what business you're really in? How do you know what business you're really in? And the question that I ask on top of that is, what's your mental model? And by mental model, what we mean is how you complete this sentence. We are in the business of. And I would suggest that how you complete this sentence is one of the most important things you'll ever do in your organization. Now, if you happen to be on the executive team, if that's you here in the audience, you have a lot of control over this. If that's not you, and you're one of the players in the organization, I'd highly recommend you go back to your CEO, go back to your VPs, and ask them this question. Mr. or Mrs. CEO, how do we complete that sentence here at Acme Corporation? How do we complete that sentence? And when you go through that process, you're going to get a lot of different answers. But before I, I tell you what the, what the answer is, I want to first talk about this here. Does anybody know what this is? What was that? Projector, Projector close. What's that? That's R2-D2. R2-D2. Early version prototype of R2-D2. That's probably what we would call the MVP of R2-D2 back in the day, but it's not. This is a digital camera. It's December 1975, made by none other than Kodak. Okay. Now, anybody hear a little story about what's happening with Kodak lately over the past few years? Right? Restructuring under bankruptcy, selling off their commercial unit, keeping their, their uh, excuse me, selling off their consumer unit, keeping commercial. Which when I heard that news, I was really shocked. Because they said Kodak is such an iconic brand. How could, they, how could they be in the situation they're in? And so I thought a lot about mental model. And I thought about how would they have completed that sentence? And I thought, you know what? They probably completed that sentence as being in the business of film rather than being in the business of capturing and sharing life's memories. And so the difference there is that we need to shift our thinking from things to concepts. All right, so we need to shift our thinking from things to concepts. Because when you do that, the way you innovate in your organization and the way your employees come to work for you radically changes. My suggestion is that had Kodak gotten it right, they would have been the ones to develop Instagram and Facebook and things of that nature. Not be blindsided by all these digital technologies and find themselves in the situation they're in. So first things first, know what business you're in and know how you complete that sentence. We are in the business of. Starbucks knows what their mental model is. Anybody know about this? Starbucks is in, in the business of being the third place. What do they mean by that? Well, when they were architecting Starbucks and trying to figure out how they were going to provide something really special, they took a look at what was happening in the UK. And in the UK, you have three common places that people experience. There's home, work, and the pub. Right? And in the UK, the pub is a socially acceptable place to be. You meet up there, it's, it's that third place. Now here in the US, if you were regularly meeting up at the bar or the pub, we might have to have a conversation. But in the UK, it's socially acceptable. And they had this concept of the third place. And Schultz and team realized that in the US, we don't have a concept known as the third place. So they wanted to be the third place. It wasn't about being the best coffee shop in the world, having the best cup of coffee you've ever seen. In fact, in independent studies, uh, and as well as put out by Consumer Reports in 2007, blind taste tests show that Dunkin' Donuts and McDonald's coffee regularly beats out Starbucks coffee in terms of taste preference. But we know who owns the brand and word coffee, right? It's Starbucks. And they know their mental model really well. 
So I would challenge you guys to think about that. We are in the business of. And so what is that for you guys? The next thing I want you guys to do when we figure out uh, staking your claim is I want you guys to start with one market segment. I think the challenge we have as marketers and as businesses, we're trying to do too much for too many people. We're trying to, we're trying to tackle eight market segments with 187 different products. And we have just as many messages and solutions to go to the marketplace with. So I want you guys to start with one market segment. So that's the way this method works. Start with one. And by market segment, I mean what portion of the market are you going after? And so start there. Once you define your market segment, you need to understand what we call the cohort buyer personas. So what that means is nobody buys in a vacuum, right? So if you're a B2B business and you're selling to an organization, you're not just selling to the VP of marketing. Involved in that cohort would be the president. You might also have the marketing specialist, the marketing manager. You might have the VP of sales in there. So you have to understand who makes up that cohort. And the reason this is really important is this recent study was done, past couple of years, is that the average sales cycle has increased 22% over the past five years due to more decision makers being involved in the buying process. So now if you're selling anything where there's a sales cycle, you have to pay attention to this and you have to understand the dynamic that's at work that's causing this. And so we have to take into consideration the multiple parties involved, the cohort. It used to be we would say, I want to get to the C-suite. That's who I want to sell to. That's old school thinking. We have to really consider that buying decisions now are done in a very collaborative manner. So let's take a look at an example. I alluded to it just a moment ago. Let's take a look. Let's say that in a B2B example, where our main person we're selling to is the VP of marketing. Right? Well, again, nobody buys in a vacuum, so we have to understand that the VP of sales is a significant player in that dynamic. Not to mention the president is going to be involved, right? And we also have to consider the marketing director, because that person's trying to have their star rise, they're trying to jockey for the next level. And then you have the marketing specialist who ends up doing all the, all the grunt work that nobody else wants to do, right? And so we have to understand how all of these people play together. And you might say, well, Frank, um, you know, that's great for B2B, but what if I have a consumer product? Hey, same thing, right? Same thing. We're selling to the wife, right? So let's say we're selling a consumer product. Uh, we're making a household decision. Well, we all know that the wife, the mom, is the key decision maker, right? So gentlemen, sorry to burst your bubble, but you don't make any decisions. It's the wife. But the husband is a... a a, uh, a person who gives input. We also have grandma because maybe grandma's in the picture. And we also have a child. And so understanding these dynamics are really important within your market segment. And then once you understand that, you have to ask yourself, what do they want more than anything else? And I want you to remove your product, your solution, whatever it is that you do for a living. I want you to set that aside for a moment. I want you to ask, what do they want more than anything else? And so in going back to our example here, when we look at the VP of marketing, we want to understand her role. Well, she's the decision maker, but the things that are important to her are things like engage, engagement, leads, conversion. And when we talk about the VP of sales, he's a key influencer, and he wants qualified leads, results, pipeline. President, no surprise, revenue, growth, differentiation, and the marketing director, content, automation, analytics, and then the, the uh, support person here, social media, blogging, email marketing. So when you understand this, this is going to help you figure out how you address these different players within the cohort. Because you have to make sure you show up with content and messaging that's relevant to each of those people. So the, defining this at the front is critical. Going back to our B2C example. Well, let's say we're talking about, uh, let's say you're a vacation company. Right? So the things that would be important to mom, to, to the wife, the mother, would be buzzwords like family friendly, special, affordable. The father, he just wants easy, he wants to make sure he's got some adult time, he wants it to be relaxing. Uh, and then we look at grandma because she's going to be helping take care of the kid. Hey, weather, can't be too hot, can't be too cold, comfort and activities. And the child wants fun, games and sugar. Right? That's really all the kid cares about. So, but you have to understand the dynamic that's at play. Again, nobody buys in a vacuum. Now, if it was just left up to the husband, this is what it would look like. This guy's a jerk, right? I mean, if it was just him, he wouldn't consider anyone else, and he would just say affordable, right? What an asshole this guy is. 
All right, so if you're having trouble figuring this out, if you're having trouble figuring this out, I highly recommend you read a book called Uncommon Service. It's not uh, it directly related to what I just talked about, but it can really help you understand your winning attributes. This is probably one of the most important business books that I've ever read. Uncommon Service, Francis Fry and Morris, and it will talk you through how you build your service model as an organization and how you develop the winning attributes. Those winning attributes, by the way, can help you understand how you make that connection with your cohort and your buyer personas. Okay, so what have, what have we done so far? We understand what our uh, mental model is. We understand what market segment we're going after, the buyer personas and the cohort. The next thing I want you to do is develop a statement of value. Now this isn't necessarily direct marketing copy that's gonna go right on your website, but it'll be your guiding light for the kind of value you're going to bring to each of the buyer personas. And it follows this construct. Your offering enables buyer persona to go from their before state, so when they were all sad and unhappy before you, to their after state, to where they are elated, successful, and full of joy because of you. And so looking at our first example, let's say in the uh, B2B example, this is how you might complete that, that construct. Acme Agency enables the VP of marketing to go from being the frustrated, stressed out, underperforming executive team member with very little to show for her efforts, to being the confident, charismatic rock star of the executive team that regularly exceeds her goals for traffic, engagement, and leads. Now that isn't, this, again, not copy that's gonna go right on your website, but you need to understand the value you're bringing and articulating the before and after. It's been said that all marketing is, is the articulation of the before to after state. Keep that in mind. All marketing is, to articulate the transformation of the before to the after state. That's your job as marketers, because you have to get people to be interested in your product, your service, your offering. And so the better you can articulate that, the more results you get. And you'll notice that what we've included in here are things that go beyond just tactical things. We're including emotional and status-driven words here, right? So when we talk about the underperforming executive, that's a status. That's a status that that VP of marketing does not want to have. Instead, they want to be the charismatic rock star that's always exceeding their goals. So you have to understand what kind of transformation you create. Now we're talking, the, the topic of today was lead generation, but if you notice, we're talking a lot about things that are really above lead generation. But it's really critical that we start from this point. Here's the vacation example, right? Mom to go from feeling like she's the worst mother ever because she's worried she won't be able to find that really special family vacation to being the envy of her friends and family, juggling all these things to create memories on an amazing vacation, right? So transformation of before to after. But here's the thing. Don't forget to put it to the test. Don't forget to put it to the test. Get in front of your target audience and start talking about these things and start seeing how they react to this kind of language. Start seeing how they react to this kind of value. All right, so we've got our foundation. We know what kind of claim we're making. We know what kind of value we're bringing to the table. Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of really designing your lead generation funnel, your lead generation strategy. So I'm gonna spend the bulk of my time today on these first two sections because I'm a firm believer that how you develop your strategy, how you develop your plan, it's some of the most important things you'll, you'll do before you start building. So let's get into this here right now. So you might hear, in this stage, a gold miner say, what's the strategy for clearing overburden, getting down to pay dirt, and bringing the pay dirt to the wash plant in a way that is efficient and beats our operating cost by X percent? A couple of key words there for those of you who don't watch the show. Overburden is all the stuff that's on top of the pay dirt. You gotta clear that off. Pay dirt is where the gold lives. And the, uh, and the wash plant is where they're gonna dump the pay dirt and run it through the machine. Okay? So that's what the gold miner is saying at this stage. They're figuring out now, okay, here's where, my, here's where my gold is, here's where my water source is, I gotta put the wash plant somewhere. They're figuring out their entire operation to make it as efficient as possible. And the business speak is, how do we get our message and offer in front of our target audience and convert them into leads and customers at a cost that's less than our maximum cost of acquisition? One of the key things I'm gonna drive home here, and we're gonna get really heady for a moment when we get deeper into this part of the presentation is, Maximum cost of acquisition. Maximum cost of acquisition. That's something as marketers, everybody in this room should know for your business what your maximum cost of acquisition is. That should be a number you know cold. The president should know that number. The VP of marketing should know that number. The VP of sales. As marketers, you should know that number. We're going to get into that. 
So we're going to start by designing your sales and marketing funnel. You guys familiar with the term funnel, I assume, right? We're a room full of marketers. But before that, we do that, I want to talk about three problems that plague people, plague marketers, when they design sales and marketing funnels. The first problem is when we design the funnel, we often design it in a way that uh, forces us to move too fast. Move too fast. Well, we're probably familiar with that term because it's, it's, uh, it's a lot like dating. So I'm going to skip that word. It's a lot like dating, right? When you're dating, if you were to approach somebody um, at the bar and you were to say, hey, how are you? My name's Frank. Thinking about, you know, cute house, picket fence. There's a couple of cars in the driveway. We've got a nice Labrador. We're going to go to Aspen in the, in the winter. What do you think? Right? We're moving too fast. We're coming on too strong. So that's what's happening in a lot of our sales and marketing. We're taking, we're asking for these big leaps and big commitments in our funnels, and instead we need to slow it down. We need to slow it down and make sure that we design it in a way that follows a natural order of events. A natural order of events. So just think about what happens in normal human relationships. What, what are we going to do first? I'm going to strike up a conversation. And the next thing we might do is, you want to grab coffee. And the next thing we might do is, what do you think about dinner? And then dinner might turn into a second dinner, a third dinner. So it follows just a natural progression. And in our sales and marketing, I'm not sure why we forget that, but we do. And so we're, we're hitting people up and we're saying, hey, how about considering us uh, for your, your, your marketing program and I want you to spend $150,000 a year with us. What do you think? Can I get on the phone? Can I just get coffee with you so I can talk about that? Big commitments and nobody wants to talk to you about that. And the one concept I want you guys to to really hit home is that small commitments lead to big commitments. It's been shown in study after study that uh, if you just get someone to make a small commitment, the big commitment is really close, really, really close. Okay? In fact, they did a study, I believe, uh, we've got the professor in the room, correct me on this if I'm misstating it, Stanford, 60s, they did a study on having uh, students come in and administer tests to people who were um, taking tests. And the person who was taking the test was an actor. And the actor was hooked up to an electric shock machine. And the person in the white lab coat said, told the student who was there to volunteer for the, for the, the job, every time they get a, an answer wrong, I want you to shock them. It's OK. Don't worry. This is sanctioned. I'm, I've got a white lab coat. And so they would do it. Well, the per there was no shock. The actor would just you know, kind of grimace and shock. Well, every time they get it wrong, they were told, instructed to increase the voltage here, right? So they got to the point where that person was willing to, most of the people were willing to, to administer like the lethal shock. And the reason is, is because all they did, all they did was ask them to make a small commitment up front. Take one small step. And as humans, when we make one small step, we want to act in accordance with that step we just made. Right? It's a psychological principle of commitment and consistency. So in your sales and marketing, ask people for small commitments. Small commitments will lead to the big commitments. Did I get that study right? Good. Yeah, thank you. So what this means is you're probably going to have to start inserting in steps in your sales and marketing process that you don't currently have. You're probably going to have to start inserting in steps that you don't currently have to get people to make small commitments. I want to interject this one in here because this one, um, when you ask people to make commitments, I really think this, this particular quote speaks loud and clear. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So the reason I'm sharing that is because if you want to ask people for any kind of commitment, you have to first show how much you're investing in them, right? You have to first show how much you care about them. So don't ever ask people to take a commitment, make a commitment, without first showing the value you're going to bring. This also requires that as marketers, we shift our mindset from a concept of promotion to enrichment. The difference is, is that we wake up every day and we ask ourselves, how can I serve my target audience, not how can I extract a dollar from my target audience? So move your mindset from promotion to enrichment. This is also what's known as giving value in advance. Giving value in advance, showing the value before you're asking for big commitments. The second problem we, we run across is that marketing and sales funnels are just not aligned. They're just not aligned at all. The problem is, is that we've never defined where marketing ends and where sales begins. And so we have these two tracks going. 
right? Marketing's doing its thing and sales is doing its thing and they never bothered to sync up, they never bothered to get in alignment. And this is really critical, especially if you're going to uh, bring in systematic lead generation for your organization, you must get these aligned. Here's an example. Uh, in your organization, sales might say, hey, the first thing we have to do is get people on the phone. I can't do anything until I get them on the phone. I have to, that's where it begins. So, in this example, marketing ends when you get them on the phone, and the goal of your marketing then is to get them on the phone. It's really important you understand the goal of your marketing. The goal of your marketing isn't to make a sale or to get people down the sales path. Your, your goal is to get them to that common point that is the first step in the sales process. So get them on the phone is the goal of our marketing. Third problem when developing sales and marketing funnels. Most budgets are based on nothing, right? Most of the time you'll hear numbers like one to 5% of revenues is what we budget or what's recommended to budget on marketing. Now I would tell you that that's a good you know, rule of thumb, but it's also not based on anything meaningful. So let's talk about that. Earlier I alluded to this idea of maximum acceptable acquisition cost. And this is what your budget has to be based on. You have to understand what are we willing to pay to acquire our customer, which will shift your mind from what's the least I can spend to what's the most I can spend. Because once you know that number, and we're going to get into some examples here in a moment, but once you know that number, you're going to look for opportunities to spend that amount rather than what happens now in the marketing department when sales gets a little tight, the budget gets a little constrained, and they start asking departments to tighten their belts, who's the first one they go to? Marketing. I've, guys, I've had it happen to me. I remember you know, 13, 15 years ago, I was a marketing director and made commitments to different vendors. CEO calls me in. We're having to redo the budget. And you go back to your vendors and pull back those contracts. I need you to not do this event this year. And here I am, you know, well, this is like the lifeblood of the organization. It's how we generate leads. It's how we generate awareness. It's how we generate engagement. But marketing is always the first to go. That will stop happening once you understand this concept here and you get it implemented in your organization. So what's the solution to these three problems? So I've summed it up in this one statement here. Our job is to architect a smarketing, smarketing funnel, right, sales and marketing aligned, that is made up of a natural order of value in advance events and supported by an acquisition budget. You need to start here when you develop your funnels. Start with this concept. And so let's take a look at the typical sales funnel, right? And here's what I mean by too many uh, nebulous and big commitments. We go from prospecting, we're on the phone, we're going to events like this, we're networking, we're emailing, we're on LinkedIn, we're prospecting. And what are we typically trying to do in sales? Trying to just get them to go to coffee, right? Something real generic. Like, hey, I'm really good. I'm really good. Let's go have coffee. We should meet each other. You know, we should know who we should be in each other's network. Let's go get coffee. And that worked for a while, but I think now more and more people are getting hit up just for coffee, and it's not working as well. It's really generic. And then what you do, if you do get them to coffee, is you're really looking for the opportunity to get them into an opportunity. Right? In our CRM, we call it opportunities or potentials or deals. And we're trying to figure out, okay, can I get, is this person ready to get into a deal with me? Are they ready to get in a deal? Can we get a project going? And then if you do, you get into a proposal and then contract. That's the typical sales funnel. So in my opinion, too many nebulous and too many big commitments. But let's look at the ideal sales funnel. If we were just to insert in a couple of small commitments and get much more specific with each stage of the funnel, we're gonna be much more successful. So now we go from uh, prospecting, and instead of asking for coffee, we're going to ask them for, or we're gonna offer some sort of no cost engagement. We call this a lead magnet. We're gonna come at them with something of very specific value. I'm gonna give you some examples in a moment. And then instead of trying to sell them a core opportunity, because let's face it, most people you come across aren't ready to do business with you right then and there. But they could, they could spend a small amount of money with you just to get something going with you, which then leads to the core opportunity. So I would suggest you need to insert in a couple of steps and get really specific. Here's the typical marketing funnel, which is to say, we're doing a lot of stuff and typically there isn't one. We're doing a lot of blogging and emailing, we got landing pages, we got all this stuff out there in marketing and often not integrated and not 
design in a funnel, when instead we should be looking at it like this, right? Everything should be leading to our content, which leads to our landing pages with follow-up email, right? Putting them together in a very systematic, strategic way. And so I'm getting to my grand finale here. So when you put it all together and you come up with a marketing funnel, this is what it looks like. And so this is how you align marketing and sales. We go from traffic, which is all that stuff you were doing in the previous slide, right? Paid social, SEO, social, et cetera, influencer outreach, native, anything else you can think of for traffic, you're sending them to content. That content is sending them to some sort of landing page with a content offer. You're following up with email, making an offer to uh, do something for them of value for no money, selling them a tripwire, which is a low cost item, finally leading into core opportunity. So we, here we have small commitments all along the way, and all along the way, nobody is being asked for a big commitment through our marketing and sales until they get to a stage where they're ready. So let's take a look at how this looks in a real world example. Uh, so let's say we're a, do you guys know what a PEO is? A professional employment organization, outsourced HR benefits, incentives. So let's say you're this kind of organization. Well, your core opportunity is $25,000 a year, $75,000 lifetime customer value, and what you're gonna provide is total HR benefits and management. Let's say that's you, right? And that's what you're trying to sell. Ultimately, you're trying to sell that thing. Well, we're gonna Tarantino this, right? You always Tarantino it, you always work backwards. Always work backwards. So what could we sell them just to kind of get the relationship going? That's literally uh, pennies. It's, it's meaningless in terms of the the value to your organization dollar-wise, but it means a whole lot in terms of the relationship. So we might offer an employee handbook. Hey, we realize that you're not ready to take on a PEO at this time and really you know, overhaul everything you're doing with how you manage employees and HR, but you guys have an employee handbook? Because we find most people don't, and you really need one that you know, meets compliance and, and sets the expectation for your employees. So you can do that for a few hundred bucks. Well, before that, you might offer to design their benefits package at no cost. Design their benefits package. Your follow-up email will be more content, helping them with everything they're interested in, making an offer for that benefits package. Your landing page, an ebook, 101 employee benefit ideas from world-class companies. And your blog post, the top five benefits every company must offer. So now we started at the, the end, and you, got, you might have been thinking, okay, Frank, where are you going with this? But now when you look at it in its totality, you see that we're leading, we've aligned the value of what we're offering, and all along the way, we're asking for small commitments, and we're providing value at every step of the way. So this is how you architect a systematic funnel that aligns marketing and sales, and is, it follows a natural order of events that gets people to do things that are not outside of their comfort zone. So now that we've got our funnel, the next thing we want to find out is how do we fund that funnel, right? How do we come up with our acquisition bud budget and how do we figure out what we call max COCA, max cost of customer acquisition? I am surprised at how many VPs of marketing, CMOs, I meet that don't know this number, that don't have these numbers dialed in. I, I, I'm really shocked. So I'm going to show you guys how we do that today. Okay, so let's look at the exact same funnel we just architected, right? Let's look at that. So if, if a customer is worth, if you're willing to spend $4,500 to acquire a customer, in the example we just gave, that's what you're willing to, to give up out of your profit margin, and you have a 50% conversion rate from your corporate, from proposal to contract, you'll know that every time you get someone to proposal, your acquisition budget is $2,250 at the max. Are you guys following me on this? Right? We're gonna, again, we're Tarantino, we're working backwards, right? Well then, every time someone goes from the tripwire to a core opportunity, if you have the conversion at the 50% there, then each of those are worth 1250. Working backwards, every time someone goes from lead magnet to tripwire at 50%, uh, 625. But now let's say we get, um, actually working the other way, 75% of the lead magnet is turned into tripwire, so that means you can afford $468.75 cost of acquisition for people at this stage. And email, you can afford $46.90 per contact. Are you guys following me on this? To get people to your landing page, you can afford $18.76. To get people to your blog post, you can afford $1.87. When you factor in those conversion rates, now you know how much you can pay for traffic. 
And that's what working backwards does. Now when you go to do your Facebook advertising, your LinkedIn ads, your Twitter ads, heck, maybe you're doing direct mail, you'll know that every piece of traffic, every impression or click has to come at $1.87. If it's more than that, you're not going to be profitable. If it's less, you should pump it and do it all day long. So this is the power of understanding your max acceptable cost of customer acquisition. When you work backwards, you know exactly what you should be paying for traffic. Now most of the time we, we go to these ad platforms and you're like, a dollar per click, I, that sounds like a lot. Five dollars per click, that sounds, I don't know. You'll now know. And so what your job is, is to then figure out a way to get as much traffic at that max acquisition cost. So we talked a lot about strategy. Now it's time to actually build, to build your machine, to build your machine that supports all of this. So a gold miner might say, let's set up the operation quickly and let's get to washing rocks. Washing rocks is a term they use because you got to dump these rocks and dirt into the machine and wash the gold off, right? And so the business translation here was let's get up and running quickly so we can start seeing results and make adjustments based on data. So this is a point I want to drive home with you guys. Don't get caught up in building things and constantly be in the mode of building. Get things good enough, get things 80 to 90%, get them in play. Because the data will tell you exactly what's happening and where you should be, uh, where should be, you should be pumping and dumping. So let's look at the key components of building uh, your, your machine. All right, so your, your website's obviously going to be a core thing. You guys got to have a, a content management system. I assume most of you have something of that with your website. Make sure you have analytics in play, CRM's really critical, and marketing automation system. So these are the four, the four major components. I would suggest to you, if you had to pick any one, um, your marketing automation system is going to really be the heart of what powers a lot of this stuff. So there are plenty of companies that do this. There's the HubSpots of the world, the Pardot, uh, the Marketos, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But these are the major components of what you're going to need as the foundation in your machine. That being said, all of this technology, all of this stuff that you need to have in play, if your organization just simply doesn't have the budget to fund all of this software, don't let this be your excuse. Do not let this be your excuse because you can run that funnel that we just designed by simply putting up a piece of content in email form and then send manual emails. You can absolutely do that. So don't let technology be your excuse as to why you cannot create a systematic lead generation machine. Put up a great piece of content in email form, and when those leads come in, manually send them an email if you have to. Now, when I say that, people often say, well, how am I going to keep up with that? That sounds like a lot of manual work. And I say, first have that problem. First have too many leads that you're having to manually follow up with, and then you can justify spend for automation software. All right, so now that you've, you've built all of that out, your job is to deliver traffic to your machine. And so a gold miner will say, run pay dirt through the plant day and night. Keep that thing running. Keep it going, because that's how we're going to make money. And so if the business translation is now that we have our marketing up and running, let's send targeted traffic to it daily. Every day, we need to be sending targeted traffic to it. But here's one thing I want you guys to keep in mind. Do not get emotional about your traffic sources. Remember, it's all about that max acquisition cost for traffic. So don't get emotional about how you do that. What I mean by that is if it requires direct mail to get that traffic and you can get it under that number, then do direct mail. If it's picking up the phone and you can pay someone X amount per hour and the amount of traffic they generate is less than that $1.87 number, or whatever that number is for you, then do the phone calling as well. Right? So don't get emotional or romantic about how you drive traffic. Your job is to drive targeted traffic at a cost that meets or beats that max number. So when we're looking at this scenario again, the two numbers you need to pay attention to when you're driving traffic are these two numbers here on the left. Right? So again, if you're paying for clicks and you're going to send them to content, $1.87. If you're going to send them right to a landing page, you guys have probably experienced this on LinkedIn, right? You see a really cool piece of content, you know, right? the 37 ways to generate leads in, in half the time for half the cost, whatever that title is, you click, and what do you get? You get a landing page, right? So if that's me and that's my ad, I would know I can afford up to $18.76 per click to that landing page. 
By the way, uh, LinkedIn's click is going to be around four, five, six, seven dollars. So then this would be profitable in this scenario all day long. Assuming you're, you're, you, met, you meet your conversion rates, of course. So you have, to, you have to go based on these two numbers, guys. You have to know these numbers cold. Because this is how you're going to go deliver traffic. Most people are not getting enough, what we call in sales, at-bats to meet their sales numbers. So the way you get more at-bats is you get in front of more people. These numbers tell you how you can afford to do that. And so once you know that, once you find those traffic sources, your job is to step on the gas. Step on the gas. So let's look at some common sources of traffic. None of these are going to be new to you guys, but it's the typical stuff, right? Organic traffic social, paid social, PPC. You could be doing some influencer outreach, retargeting. Your own email list can deliver traffic back and get them in your funnel, all those things. But let's talk about how you can get creative with traffic, right? You can do joint ventures. Anybody, you guys know what a joint venture is? Okay, so a joint venture is where uh, there's another organization that targets the same customer you target, but you guys do different things. And so you come together and you create some sort of new content offering. You guys maybe get together and do a research project. And so you take your data and they take their data and you compile it and you come up with a, a research report that's unique in the marketplace. You do a joint venture and now you have a piece that both of you can distribute, right? And they can get it in front of their audience and vice versa. Direct mail, yes. Yes, you can drive traffic with direct mail. Again, as long as it meets or beats that acquisition number. I mentioned phone calling. Oh my, right? Especially in today's world, I think a lot of us are afraid to get on the phone. And then anything traditional, right? Radio, TV, print. Don't discount those. Don't, don't believe people when they say print, print is dead, direct mail is dead, radio is dead, TV is dead. If you can get it within your acceptable cost of acquisition, it can work for you. All right, so now in the, the fifth stage is this concept of separating the gold. So you've, you've run everything through the machine, and now you've got to separate the gold. So the gold miner might say, the sluices look good. Let's filter it to see what we've got. So the sluices, if you guys aren't familiar with the show, are the final stage of their wash plant where everything deposits, and all they're left with is fine dirt and gold. Okay. So those are the sluices. And what they've got to do is they've got to take all that material and run it through one final uh, process to pull the gold out. And so in business terms, we want to make sure that now that our machine's done its job and we have leads and opportunities in front of us, we have to make sure we don't settle for less than ideal customers. We have to make sure we don't settle for anything less than what we designed. Because I will tell you that the quality of your customer base directly affects the quality of your organization. If you want to be a premium organization, go get premium clients. So when you separate the gold, I want you to be filtering out people that don't meet your standards. You have to do this because, uh, again, it affects the quality of your organization. And so you do that by targeting, uh, being hyper-focused in your language, your content, your offers. Make sure in your content you're telling people exactly who it's for and who it's not for. Make sure you're providing specific value. Heck, if you want to even include job titles or very specific life situations, get as targeted as possible because if you're not, what's gonna end up happening is you're going to have people come into your machine that aren't qualified. And then you're gonna end up at some point in the sales process scratching your head going, I'm not sure why that deal didn't close and I'm not sure why they're not responding to me. Well, the reason that is is because you have people coming into your machine that don't belong into your into your machine. So get really targeted. You also have to remember to ask people to take action. So in your funnel and in your content, it's nice to provide value, 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 but at some point you actually have to ask them to do something. So be very clear when it's time to ask them to do something, ask them to do something and get really specific about what you're asking them to do. So in our example earlier, when we wanted to uh, provide that free analysis for them, be very specific. I can do X, Y, and Z, and the reason I do this is because, and I've got two slots available this week. Can I do this for you? Because I think it'd be really valuable for you. Get specific and ask. And again, ruthlessly filter people out. I can't tell you how much of your time will be wasted if you don't do this. One of my salespeople, uh, this was last quarter, we were talking about some opportunities that didn't come to fruition. And as we reviewed each one, and I, I talked with her, 
and we reviewed each one, she came to the realization. She said, it was lost at BANT. You guys heard that term, BANT? Budget authority need timing, which is part of the qualification. She said, it was lost at BANT. And I said, exactly. They should have never even made it into proposal. They should have never even made it into, you know, this analysis and all these other things we're doing because we didn't ruthlessly filter them out. So this is the, th the final thing you have to do when it comes to separating the gold. Do not let people come past a certain point if they don't meet the standard of what you're looking for in a client. All right, so now you're doing all this. Everything's up and running. You cannot forget to maintenance the operation. Sixth stage, maintenance the operation. A gold miner might say, if we don't keep an eye on things, we could have a breakdown that shuts us down for a week, right? Because they're out in the Klondike and you can't just go run over to Home Depot and pick up a, a whatchamacallit. They literally have to go order it and go drive and, and, and shutting down could be disastrous. So in business, we have to make sure that if we don't regularly measure and adjust, we might, be throwing, might as well be throwing money out the window. So that's the business translation, regularly measure and adjust. And what you're looking to do is you want to make sure you optimize for conversion and experience. So you're looking for conversion all along that path, but you're also looking to make sure that you're providing the brand experience that, represent, that, that represents what you want. Because let's face it, not everyone is actually going to go through your funnel. Not everyone is actually going to download your piece of content and start into your funnel. So you want to make sure they leave with the right brand impression. They want to make sure they leave with the right messaging so they understand who you are and who you're for. So conversion and experience is what you're after. And you want to be optimizing weekly. So if you're not doing that right now, if you're looking at your analytics once a month and maybe making changes quarterly, that's too infrequent. This stuff requires that you're working on it every week. So let's talk about things that you could be looking at every week. You want to look at your traffic and find out where is it coming from and how can we improve that. So from an organic standpoint, look at your opportunities for SEO. Where are we getting traction right now and how can we continue to pump that? What are keywords and, and long tail keyword phrases that we have opportunities on that nobody's targeting? Looking at your paid traffic, what's your click through rate on your ads, what's your quality score? Because those things will affect how often your ads are getting shown. So in Facebook, for example, if you have a low quality score, they'll start throttling back how often your ad is shown. So you want to take a look at those things because you want to keep the traffic coming. Social, your click-through, your engagement. What are we doing there that's driving traffic and what can we do to optimize that to improve it? Take a look at your key web pages and define a page goal for every key web page. So for example, on your home page, what's the defined goal? It might be to get them to your about page, for example, where they're going to really learn more about what you do. It might be to get them to your portfolio. But whatever that is, define that goal and measure it. And every week measure how many people are clicking on the button that takes them to the portfolio. And if it's at 5% now, how can we get it to 7? If it's at 7, how can we get it to 10? Right? So measure your page goals on a weekly basis. Blog posts. So for your blog posts, I want you guys to look at click-throughs to your landing pages, right? From your calls to action. You guys know what a CTA is, right? Right? So on your CTAs, what percentage of people on that blog post are clicking through to the landing page? And you want to be 5 to 10%. And so when you're looking at those things, if it's not in that range, you want to start uh, adjusting uh, language on your call to action, your button color, any creative that's associated with it. Once they're on your landing page, again, looking at this weekly, you want 30 to 50% of visitors to your landing page to press that, enter that form and press that submit button. 30 to 50%. If that's not happening, Look at headline, look at subheadline, look at your body copy, look at the bullets, look at the form length, the form heading, the button language, the button color, the main image. All of those things can be adjusted and tweaked, and they should, to make sure you're in that 30 to 50% range. Email, obviously the usual suspects, opens, clicks, unsubscribes, how many people are taking you up on your offer that you're making through your, your follow-ups. Lastly, we're going to talk about growing the operation. So we're going to talk about growing the operation. So once you have everything dialed in and you feel like, man, this, this is working. This is really working. What can we do to take it to the next level? So you might hear a gold miner say, next season, we're going to double our take. And anybody who watches the show knows that after the end of every season, they think they're going to double their take. They're going to go from 1,000 ounces to maybe, uh, I think Todd said 3,000 ounces, right? He went from 1,000 to 3,000. And he hit it, by the way. 
And so in business, we might, we might say, hey, everything's dialed in. Let's set our goals even higher. How can we do more? How can we grow more? How can we increase revenues? How can we increase market share? So a number of the ways you're going to do that are you can start targeting more buyer personas within the cohort. So let's say you started your machine out, you picked your one segment, and you picked a lead buyer persona, and things are starting to work. Well, ways you can continue to grow the operation is you can start to include other buyer personas and create more content for those additional people, right? And pull those people in. You can also add more content and co content offers that address additional hot button issues. So in our HR example earlier, the hot button issue was about employee retention and engagement or acquisition. And so that's a hot button issue. But you might then start to say um, employee morale. Employee morale might be another hot button issue where you can develop more content around and bring more people in through another series of content that focuses on another uh, hot button issue. You can also pump up your paid media budget now that you know it's working, double and triple your paid, your paid budget. And then you can also build additional machines to start targeting additional market segments. So the market segment earlier in the HR example might have been agencies, for example. Let's say they're going after companies like mine. Okay, the market segment we're going after are agencies of 10 to 20 employees. That's our market segment. So to grow the operation, you might now say, we're going to go after we're going to go after construction companies of 10 to 30 employees. That's our next market segment, and we're going to start to tackle that. And lastly, to wrap this up, none of this works unless you do. Guys, this is not set it and forget it kind of stuff. We talk a lot about automation. We talk a lot about building machines that systematically generate leads kind of while you sleep kind of thing. But it requires real ongoing work. It requires real ongoing work and waking up to serve your target audience every day and constantly be bringing value to them. It would be nice if we could record a piece of content, put it up in a machine, and just kind of sit back at home and the checks kind of just come in. Uh, unfortunately, it's not how it works. So it really requires a commitment to bringing value to your target audience every single day. And so here's my offer to you. If you or your organization are intrigued by this kind of concept, I will personally help do a session with you to help you figure out if this kind of funnel could work in your organization. And what we'll do on the phone is we'll design out your funnel and your acquisition costs. So I'll do that for you guys at no charge. Uh, all, I, all I ask is that you have your VP or president on the phone with me, and I'll do that for you at no charge. So that's my offer to help you guys. If this is interesting to you, if you're looking to get a systematic lead generation program up and running, the first step is understanding, will this even work? Because if you, if you have a product that is, let's say, $500, that's the cost of the product, you might not be able to fund a full-scale effort like this. So what I'll do is I'll help you figure that out, what your funnel needs to be, and what those acquisition numbers are. And so you'll, you'll walk away with having that in hand, knowing exactly what you need to build out. No cost, no obligation, just me helping you value in advance, right? Uh, so there's my email address. If you want to take me up on that, hit me up. I'd, I'd love to help you guys. And that concludes my talk today. Thank you for having me. I told you guys I would talk fast and furious because that was a lot to get through. I will say that that particular methodology, we could take weeks to really dial, in, dial that in and train and educate on that alone. In fact, my people, when they come work for me, they go through a couple of months of training just on these concepts. So, we tried to distill all that into 60 minutes. So hopefully that was successful. Hopefully you guys walked away with just a few nuggets, no pun intended, to help you guys uh, in your operation, generate more leads for you guys. Again, connect with me. I'd love to talk with you guys, hear your thoughts. If you think I'm full of, full of it, uh, you, you uh, disagree with something I said, let me know that too. You have any follow-up questions, hit me up. I'd love to connect with you guys.